And whatever we can, whatever we do, whatever God lead us, always have that same heart to say, Lord, I want to honor you. I want to touch people. I want to make sure your grace will not just be upon me. Let me also allow that grace to be in others. Okay, let me read us a scripture we have. This morning, I want to read here, 1 Chronicles chapter 21. There's going to be a chapter we want to read. Okay? Let me read on here. This is about David. We know him to be a mighty king, a man after God's heart. This is a moment that perhaps he never truly understand why he did it. Something in his heart and something about his nation God is about to expose. So this is actually an expose on what David had during that time. Let me read it. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1 to 2. The Bible tells of this story about David. It says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. Verse 2, So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, Go, and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan. Then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. So you look at this, you realize, Lord, what, what just happened? Right? A lot of people need that. If you're in government, you need to know from time to time over the years how many people are there in your country. Why? Because that's part and parcel of the heart of government to serve the people. You cannot serve people well if you don't know how many are there. You know, how you have grown or what particular areas does government need to reach out more. So that's perhaps in the heart of David. But something in here doesn't seem to be right. You realize, Lord, we look at the Bible. Amen? You love reading your Bible? Huh? You enjoy reading it? I hope you read it more than you read anything else. Because if you're looking for headline news, it's already written ahead. It's happening as we speak because it was written thousands of years before we are even here. The Bible is full of stories. Stories of men. Perhaps a, a hindsight or a, a portion of their biography. Okay? Their heroics and their ep epic failures. We look at the Bible, we look at mighty men, God allowed that to be seen there in red because God doesn't cover up for his people. He never, you know, stops people from praising. He never even covered them up when he had to really expose things. And the way God exposed men is the way he will deal with all of us. Why? Because ultimately God would say, I love you, my son, my daughter. I love you so much that I won't allow anything to come in between us that will prevent you from knowing me and from walking straight with me in this lifetime. So we read up stories and realized, Lord, the Bible is filled with imperfect people just like me. Can you say that? Just like me. Okay? So I said, Lord, I'm glad Abraham lied. Because people would lie from time to time. There are reasons why. Amen? It's not good to lie. But you realize, oh, he lied? Well, I lied myself. I'm almost happy to know that Jacob deceived people because people still deceive people nowadays. Amen? In this world right now, you don't know what's real. What seems to be real isn't real. Jacob deceived people. Abraham lied. I said this morning, I'm comforted that Moses lost his temper. Sino dito, who among you, you know, Lost tempers lately. Huh? People would say, ah, you're just too hot-headed. No, wait till you drive and you realize how hard it is. Even if you try to be saintly, people will just cut you off. Oh my, does he know? Did he study, you know, driving? Why would this person just, out of nowhere, people lost tempers. So did Moses. One miss. That's the reason why he never entered promised land. Physically. Yeah, spiritually he did in Jesus' time. But you look at that, you realize Thomas, one of the disciples, original, he doubted. He said, unless I touch the hands crucified, I won't believe. Mark backslid. Right? Remember John Mark? Not my son. 
with that mark, he backslid. That's the cause between Paul and Barnabas quarreling, and God used that quarrel sometimes to expand his kingdom. Peter denied Jesus, and how many of us would do so? You would say, well, I never denied God with my words, but most of the time, people would deny God in their actions. Wherever we go, we represent God. Amen? When you're inside schools, in your classroom, do you, do you represent God? Hello? When you say, well, pastor, I don't cheat. Yeah, you don't cheat. That's good. But that teacher is just peeling off hell. Did you ever raise your hand and said, Mom, that's too much, or sir, that's too much? I don't think that's right. Do you represent God? You are God's ambassadors. We are all God's ambassadors. We deny most, not with words, but with actions. Action speaks louder than words. As they say, you say it best when you say nothing at all. Evil triumphs when good men are silent. Okay, I'm not saying you rally in the street. It's just that when something is wrong, please. Men, in the offices, don't be silent. A lot of our bosses double deals and teaches us all the more how to cheat. Will you make a stand? Not because you know more or your spiritual or feel a pride. Will you ever tell your boss, this won't go anywhere? Everything na nagain natin, it will be lost anyway. Amen? God will test us. God will always push us there so that we will really represent Him to be His people. I'm glad people like them in the Bible and people like us, we sometimes fall flat in our face. We sometimes think we're pride, you know, Lord, thank you, I've never really compromised the last three months, and then you flop suddenly. Why? Because people are people. And sometimes God allows that to test us and humble us. We look at David. He was a great hero. Okay? Yet, God never spared his words. David became an adulterer. Later on, a murderer. And in that verse, later in his life, a hidden sin in his heart was exposed. He did something unthinkable before God. He made a census. God's anger burned in David and in Israel. It resulted to 70,000 dead men. These are not ordinary men. These are fighting men, able-bodied, able to fight with any type of weapon. Amen? If you think Israel soldiers today, the IDF, is armed to the teeth, believe me, they've been like that for thousands of years. If Israel today is surrounded by enemies, so is Israel before. The mightiest of empires, Assyrians, Babylonians, Egyptians, Hittites, all those mighty tribes around them, what was before is still living today. And they're armed to the teeth. Why has David's mistake caused the lives of 70,000 men dying? Three days. Sunod, sunod. God never spared anything there. We saw David as a father, he also failed. It's a message for all of us, whether you're a father already or you're dreaming to be a dad one day, building a family of your own. His son Ammon, remember? He raped his half-sister Tamar. Those are inside David's family. His favorite son, Absalom. He had head above shoulders, almost like Brad Pitt in an Arnold Schwarzenegger body. Guapo. Handsome did a coup d'etat and slept with David's concubine in front of everybody on the roof where all Israel could see. He shamed his dad. Another son, after David died, Adonijah almost robbed Solomon of the kingdom. Just like Jacob, he tried to deceive Solomon. And Solomon, so brilliant, right? We love Solomon, full of wisdom. He didn't finish well himself. Look at David, he might be mighty, but he has his failings. But you look at that and realize, Lord, so what happened? Did you ever hate him and, you know, kick him out? Nope. What happened? We look at David, something happened to him. As a young shepherd boy, as a king on the rise, 
he lost his head, saw a naked woman, beautiful, took her, you know, impregnate her. Finally, when this cannot be covered up, he allowed the murder, almost a perfect crime. But God knew. As he said to Moses, your sin will find you out. This today is about hidden things in our lives. I know we love God, and so does David. But in that love, God wants us to walk with Him. Perfection is not instant. Perfection is the everyday thing we do as we walk with God in the fear of God, in the humility of life, in the understanding, Lord, without you, wala ako, I can't do anything. What had happened here? You know, the sin of David is not because of that census. Remember, in the book of Numbers, Moses himself numbered Israel. Was God angry? No. Nothing happened with Moses. But why here? Why is it that when David tried to do a census, God dealt with him severely, killed 70,000 of his fighting men? The sin was not counting the people, actually. The sin was because David counted on the people. It's not counting the people. Everybody does census. Pride suddenly took hold of his heart. And he realized, man, I have so much. You know, I need less of God, more of these people, and I can make Israel great. When he did make that command, Joab, his chief commander, his defense secretary, never really agreed from heart. Even his military commander said, uh-oh, but he prevailed on them. He overcame them because he is king. As they say in Filipino, ang utos ng hari, hindi mo kayang baliin. So they obeyed even with a heavy heart. Nine months and twenty days later, the report came. There were two versions of that, Second Samuel and First Chronicles. In Second Samuel, they said Israel had 800,000 fighting men, able-bodied, able to draw weapons of any kind. Judah, 500,000 men, that's Second Samuel, that's totaling 1.3 million. Now, I don't think Philippines has that number even today. 1.3 million fighting men. And other parts, First Chronicles, a variation. Joab said, there are 1.1 million fighting men in Israel alone, with Judah having 470,000 men. They're not even counting the Levites. These are so powerful. So 1. Point, you know, in First Chronicles, it's not 1.3, it's 1,570,000 men. And you know what God did? He took the 70,000. That's too much. You trust in horses and horses and spears and weapons. What's that again? 1,570,000? I'll get the 70. Do you think it's okay? No. It will affect so many. This nation was an uproar when 44 sub men, men died. This is 70,000 guys. Not even 70. 70,000. If they are married men, you count the widows and the orphans. This could almost cost David his throne. Everybody was perhaps angry and reacting. How can a king lost 70,000 men in three days? They were not even in the field fighting. You know what happened to them? Suddenly they lost life. I mean, they were in the gym. Suddenly they dropped like dead flies. Realize when you fumigate your homes, you kill the cockroaches, they just drop dead. That's what happened. Because right here, God saw that heart and He allowed the prophet God, G-A-D, the seer, to talk to David. You did something. God dealt with David in Israel about that hidden sin of pride inside the king's heart. His trust and confidence was never on God this time. He grew old. He grew wise. He grew strong. He grew experienced, but he never understood from day one, it was not them, it was not him. God is the defender of Israel. God made him king. Suddenly he forget that. You know, the lessons for that, sometimes you go on in life and the blessing starts coming. Right? And we were not careful, God will deal with us. Things. God gave us talents and giftings. God gave us promotions. God gave us a lot of things. But in the midst of all these glory things, 
It's easy to lose the sight of God because when we're flying out there and soaring, suddenly we think it was us and never God giving us that firepower deep inside. You look at David, how did he start? He's obscure, he's unknown, he's forgotten. Remember, Samuel came to the town. I think months or weeks before that, Samuel did the unthinkable. God called Saul to kill the king, Agag. Kill everybody, kill the king. He spared the king. Samuel came there and said, why is the king still alive? And the king said, we're, you know, we're relatives, we're friends. <laughs> He's not killing me. You know what he did? The unthinkable. A priest should not supposed to put blood in his hands. He cut off the head of that king. To show Saul, if you're not going to do it, I'll do it. So when he visited Bethlehem this time, everybody was fearful. Right? The first question when they saw Samuel at dusk, he came there in secret. God told him, do not make noise. Go there to anoint one of Jesse's son. It's a secret mission to go there. But when they saw them, the whole town was shaking. We heard what you did to the king of our enemies. You cut his head off. Do you come in peace? Right? Imagine a, a town full of people asking, do you come in peace somewhere? Are you going to chop someone's head off today? That's not supposed to be you. But remember, he's not just priest. Samuel is judge over Israel. He said, no, I come in peace. I come to anoint the next king. He said, it's in your household, Jesse. Jesse immediately prepared something there, a feast for, for, for the visitor. Kasi VIP talaga si Samuel. Eh. And paraded seven of his sons. Wow! Each one came. It's like in a fashion show, right? All dressed up and mighty. And one after the other, the Lord, the Lord told Samuel, that's not the one. They're all hungry and that's not the one. Is this all you got? Sadly, uh, no more sons. I think there's one left. God remember David. No one of them remembered, not even the dad. Some theologians said maybe just like in those days, David might have been the son of a concubine. He's not first family. That's why the brothers don't care about where he's there or not. Right? Remember this, in your own homes, even if you have quarrels with your brother or your sister, you will remember someone because that's part of your original family. That's flesh and blood. But that was just flesh and blood with dad on a concubine perhaps. And nobody cared about him if he's there or not. God remembered him. Remember, not one of his old brothers would say, ah, we forgot the, the youngest. Nobody even commented that. Remember him? When he was fighting Goliath, they were still hitting on him. And I'm glad that Pastor Dave is always reminding to teach us the Saul and David thing. David passed the test. He overlooked that. He said, okay, I just came to your, perhaps second to my family. It doesn't matter. But God saw an obscure boy playing worship with the sheep. Kita <laughs> This is a man after my own heart. So he anointed him. You realize, Lord, how can a man who's tending sheep? That's why I said, I took you over from tending sheep to be ruler over my people. Wow. A boy almost unknown to everybody. Guys, you look at David. How many of us were like that? That's it's so humble, uh, humbling when Paul said, not, not one of us. Same with David. He was, of, you know, no pansin nga eh. Forgotten. God remembered. You may be doing your best now. Working your head off every day. Thinking nobody even noticed you. But God see your heart. If you're in that place. That you're doing your best every day. Just uh, giving it all. And you're feeling like you want to quit. Don't quit. Somebody not on earth. Looks on you. He notices you. Time will come, he'll raise you up. Why? Because he cannot just let someone whose heart is after him just be an ordinary person. He don't want David to be an ordinary person. So you look at this guy. How can an insignificant guy be made royalty? You realize even in his midlife, 
he got into the Bathsheba and Uriah issue. Like I said, right? Kings supposed to be fighting in the time of war, he relaxed. And in that relaxation, just like this time again, he made census, he was in relaxed mood. So all of us, men or women, especially men, amen? I'm not saying don't rest, but the moment you relax and just live and bask in the glory of your own strength, just when you thought you're strong, the enemy will come sneaking behind. That's what happened. Bathsheba was not just another Bathsheba. It's an incident bound to happen because David never stood the way he is. The guy in worship, the guy with drawn sword, always fighting for God. Right? Being king, nobody can refuse her. So the, the woman went to her. That was the time she just finished her monthly period. She's so fertile. Something happened to her. News came back. I'm pregnant. He said, okay. Being wise, there's a way. I'll get Uriah so that he'll own the child. But Uriah was, how can I do that? Most of my friends are dying. They're fighting in the field. So in short, he never laid with his wife, never slept with her. Uh-oh, there goes trouble. But she was sent letter again. Look, I got my bumps. It's showing. Okay, plan B. He told Joab, come here. Go to where the fighting is. When it got to be so hot, okay, include Uriah there, and then this is the strategy. Once the enemy is so strong, leave him alone. Uriah was a man so loyal to David. So loyal. That's why God was so angry with David. How can you betray a person who's so loyal to you? You won't even, you know, go to bed with a wife because he can't do that while all his friends are fighting. In the heat of battle, they all left. That's the strategy. So what happened there? It's called killed in action. Just like what you say in the movie, ten, 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 eh? ten, ten, ten. David was folding the flag. Ten, ten, ten. I'm sorry, Mrs. Jordan. Actually, it's me who killed him, not the enemy. What's that called? Perfect crime. Hidden. This morning I was asking people, I know there are things in our life that we kept hiding from. Things that we never really hate. Sins that we practice and we enjoy doing, and yet when we get convicted, we cry a little and then do it again. It's not stopping. God was saying, if you want to be great, if you want my anointing, it has to stop, it has to be dealt with. God exposed it. He used a prophet, a friend of David, right? Remember what he said? One rich man had so much sheep, he had a visitor, there's a neighbor that had one sheep, they love it so much, they treat it like humans. That sheep sleeps with them, plays with the children. And when that special guest came, he said, no, no, don't kill any one of our numerous sheep. Just get one from the poor guy. And slaughtered them, and that sheep became a dinner. And David was bursting in anger. That guy needs to be punished. Nathan looked at his eyes. It's you. He cannot hide no more. He fell on his knees and begged God. There's something in David. Just like here. Something happened to him. Let's look at another verse. First Chronicles, same chapter, 21, verse 8 and 9. Let's see the response of David. You know what he said here? David said to God, I've sinned greatly by doing this. Now, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. The Lord said to God, David, seer, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. Wow, three options. Three months, three weeks, three days. What are those three months? He said, three months perhaps of pestilence. People die. Three weeks of you running away from your enemy because they will attack you. Or basically three short days that you will fall in the hands of the Lord. Being a quick repenter, 
And just like most of us, we want quick things, right? And our generation is always instant. Instant noodles, instant coffee, instant lahat. So I want the instant three days. Yeah, you'll fall in the hand of God. Three days, 70,000 men dead. God made up his mind. Perhaps if it's three months, 70,000 will still die. Three weeks, 70,000. So make it quick. Three days. Israel was in uproar. You know what makes it so hurtful? Those men never died in battle. At least yung sa mga sapano nagbarilan pa. This one, they just drop dead like flies. In their healthy life, some of them may be exercising in the field. They just drop dead. Angels begin to kill those men. David was shocked. What have I done? You know one thing with David? Something we can look upon and copy from him. He quickly repents. He's a quick repenter. You know the advantage of repenting quick than prolonging it? When you prolong, your heart hardens. And God will deal you with you even greater. I may be just like my son, the only child, and my dad is always busy around. I see him sometimes. Most of the time, I don't. Because he's busy. It's always me and my mom. So you think, ah, you're a mama's boy. Wrong. I believe in my healing time, Pastor Dave helped me deal with it. My mom grew up in that mentality of freely disciplining, but I don't call it discipline. I call it beatings. Because <laughs> when she's mad, she would just grab everything. If that's a hunger, walis, pat, pat. Don't get me wrong, I love my mom. Ngayon, yeah, birthday na siya, 88. I love her so much. I've learned from all those things. But you know what? I was quick to learn something, that when I run, I got scathed a lot. But when I run near God, not away from God, or near my mom, she can't hit me, right? If I run, that leather belt is like buntot ng pag It's long. So I learn my trade. When I'm wrong, I'm not gonna run. Anyway, she'll catch me up to a corner, hit me. Right? I run to her. And embrace her mama no. <laughs> she can't hit me now. Because when she tries to hit it, she hits herself. I said, what's the parallelism to that? That's the way all of us should deal with our sin. When you know you're wrong, quickly repent. Run to God, not run away. You'll be hit hard. Believe me, you cannot hide from God. Adam and Eve had that lesson. They thought they were hiding. There's sin. There's no place. Just like David said, where can I hide from your presence? No, you cannot. Our sins will find us out. But are we humble enough to admit, God, I'm wrong. I sin against you. That's what David did. He went to his knees. Just like what he did with the time of Bathsheba, he went to his knees, he repented. After being confronted by the seer, see God, he fully repented. And he's also fully accountable. Throngs of people, multitudes are crying out, Why are our men dead? There's no war to speak of. They just died. Something's wrong. Okay? God dealt with David and with his nation. You're full of pride. You think you did no need me? I'll deal with you. Why? Because when God does that to David, he really yearns to look at that boy that he got from the field worshiping. You know us, when we started with God, do you recall those days when you start afresh, when you came to know God early? You were crying, right? You won't miss your worship. You won't miss your Bible. But we know more. Thank God that we've been taught by people, even Pastor Dave, the purpose of pastors teaching us is that we could really draw closer to know God more and be humble, not to put ourselves too much knowledge and miss out on what's real. That's not the purpose why our pastors teach us. Those teachings are meant to draw us closer, not to draw us away and think we can make it on our own. It's not. That's what happened to David. God missed that little boy that worshipped him. God missed the guy who fell on adultery and just fell on his face. Now he's older. 
He's looking for that worshiper inside of this king. And so does God looks at us. Remember, the consequences of our sin does not really fall on us straight. It falls on the people we love. When a man commits adultery, it deeply affects the wife, the children, the immediate family, the clan, the peers, the friends. And if it's a Christian, the church. How come we get deceived to think that our sin is just us? That sin affects people. That's why God is serious about sin, because sin might be personal, but the after effect of that affects people, and you cannot count how many more people will be affected because one person decides to lose it all. But God in His mercy holds back judgment. Giving us time to understand, just like the prodigal son. Right? The same God that looks for him is the same God that looks to us. It doesn't matter whether you're sinning or not. But when you do sin, when we do fall, when we do fall, what do we do? Do we harden hearts? Do we hide? Do we run away? Or do we just run to God and say, Lord... I was flying so hard for six months. I'm with no sin. Wow. And yet today I just fall flat. Yes, son, because you rely on your strength, your knowledge. Every time, hold on to me. I'm your big dad. You're my little kid. In my heart, you're still my little boy. That's the heart of God for every one of us. You think you grow strong in God? No, your dad still loves you like kids. Care for you. Right? It's not that God don't look at us mature. He just wants to protect us. You know nature ni God eh. He wants to always put us into a position where we can really follow Him. To secure us. Only God can secure. Not us. Not even we with my family. Amen? You look at that Lord. You know this. You know my heart. You know David's heart. You know our hearts. But are we like David? Are we quick to repent? Are we quick to be very accountable? Kasalanan ko to. It's my fault. I'll make amends with people. Right? Sometimes in marriage, husband and wife would quarrel, and in that quarrel, man, forgive me. Yo nga. Forgive me. How can you say forgive me and you're angry? Right? I was telling the husbands this morning, when you ask forgiveness and you did wrong, Remember the day when you proposed, you knelt down and offered that ring? Same attitude. When you're wrong, you're wrong. We may be men, but let me tell you, God gave us our wife to make us understand in this life, we can never walk alone. God created someone to be your guard, to be a protection for you. Amen? Okay? So husbands, Whenever you go, please always make sure your loving wife knows where you are or she can go with you, please. It's not that she doesn't trust you. There's so much in this world today you have to be so protected on because if not, believe me, people just fall like flies. Men do. Even marriages are shaken. 21 verse 18. This is what God told David. Okay, you want to solve this thing? This is God's command. You know what he said exactly in verse 18? It says here, Then the angel of the Lord ordered God, the seer, to tell David to go up and build an altar of the Lord to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that God had spoken in the name of the Lord. You realize at this time, the highest point of that city in Jerusalem was the threshing floor of Arona. If you may not know it, you don't have to Google it. You just have to look present day where the Temple Mount is. Right? There's a temple, an Islamic temple there. That's the site of this offering. It's the highest place. So when you go to the threshing floor, what are threshing floors, by the way? It is usually a high place where people could go and see as farmers would separate wheat from chaff. Now, we don't eat wheat. We eat rice, right? In Filipino setting, that's like the palay. 
You cannot just cook the palay. Who, who eats palay with rice? No? You have to separate the husk, right? We call it the ipa. The same way here. The chaff is like the ipa. You have to separate it from the wheat so that the wheat can be eaten, okay? And consumed. So a threshing floor is usually a high place. So that's a perfect place for it. It, uh, it is a place so high that it became public. Everybody would know. Just like Jesus when he died on the top of that hill, it's obvious. Everybody can see him even from miles away that the Son of God died. Why does God want David to do that? In a place where you process to separate wheat and chaff because David wants to see or wants Israel, God wants Israel to see David, his willingness to go public about his sin. That's why you cannot hide sin. Your sin will find you out. Jesus said, whatever is whispered in the inner rooms, it will be shouted on the roof. Why? There will come a day when the things we hide, if that's a practiced sin, God will have to reveal it. That's why this is a moment we realize, Lord, let me humble myself. Sin is pleasurable only for a season. In the end, it brings death. Help me. Because I want to walk right with you. I don't want to struggle with things. And I don't want to go up and down in my faith like a roller coaster. They want to go like that. God wants to build permanence one level to the next. Of course, the next level, there'll be challenges. But God wants to build strong in the life of his people. So here it is. He goes public. He never allowed David to repent on a corner where nobody can see. You know how God allowed these things? Because he wants everybody to know you've been right with him. That's why when you do Christian baptisms, it's a public declaration before earth, heaven, and hell that you're no longer following the devil. Okay? You don't get baptized secretly. Baka kayo kailan nakakaalam nun eh. No one knows. The same way here. God wanted the king to publicly declare his back. What? As king? No. As a worshiper of God. It's not our talents, guys. Everyone, God created you and I one reason. To be worshipers. Before he is king. When he was a shepherd boy, unknown, he's a worshiper. When he fall flat on adultery, he worship. He grow old. It's missing. He's so professionalized. He forgot. God still looks for worship. You cannot outgrow worship, guys. You cannot outgrow prayer life. You cannot outgrow your Bible. Amen? You cannot outgrow loving one another because if you fail on that, we totally fail on everything else. Because those are the deepest things in God's heart. David was a worshiper again. In that threshing floor, what happened? Usually in a threshing floor, there's an oxen. An oxen is the preferred animal in a Jewish home. Anong gagawin ng oxen? The oxen will step on the wheat. Ang tanong, do you want to be stepped on? Ayoko nga. You know what discipleship is? Pastor David has been sharing discipleship. Discipleship is allowing people to help you deal with those things in your life. Because some people would say, oh, ako, I want to be discipled only by that guy exclusively. That's why when you ask people, who disciples you? See Jesus. Wow, you're blessed. I mean, since the day I repented, I've never been discipled by Christ directly. But you are directly discipled by Christ? Yeah, only Jesus and me only. <laughs> Who's the accountability? Me and Jesus too. I love you. Oh, I envy you, huh? I've been walking 30 years. I've never been like, I know I love God. But you know what discipleship is? He assigned it to all of us. To one another. That's why he left Peter. You're not orphans. I'm giving you something so powerful. The Holy Spirit. Right? Remember the preaching weeks ago? Go and make disciples. We're empowered to do so. Here it is. Oxins are people. They're not just pastors. They're leaders and people. Even your peers. Whom you allow to step over you. Yan. Gusto niyo bang naapakan kayo? Madidil yung pride niyo. Mabubulatlat yung ibang bagay. I'm a very private person. Yeah, your God died publicly. Christianity is not a private religion. It's a public faith. Are you open to let people, not all, 
few people to deal with you. They're going to be auctions. Next, what's used there in the, in the threshing floor? Rods. They'll beat, right? Right here. Yung mga ipanampalay, we beat, right? They allow those things. And then there's this fork. Parang pala. They lift you in the air to separate so the air can blow the, the shaft from the wheat. If you're the wheat, do you think it's an easy thing? Discipleship is not an easy thing. It's easy to catch fish. You know that? Do you cook? Huh? We tried fishing. Oh, grab and tagalong. Finally, I catch fish. So what? That's all? No, you have to clean that. What? I mean, I have to cut it, take away the inner. Yeah. Discipleship is doing that. Cleansing. No, it's just me and Jesus. Yeah, he will do that. But who is accountable to you on planet Earth? Are you willing to be vulnerable before a few of those people? That's why we have small groups. Huh? Amen. They're not talking groups. Na, alam mo, you know, pwentuhan lang. No, it's more than that. They're not bonding group that you cry out. It's an accountability group where you can grow. Discipleship is never easy. It's easy to catch fish. The hardest part is you clean that fish so that when you cook it, it's so tasty. Can God eat that fish? Can God eat from our lives? You can just offer God, Lord, eat me now, my life. I mean, nangangamoy eh. Who's cleaning you up? No one. It takes preparation, it takes people. So that's the threshing floor experience. Then the altar, next. He built an altar to a Jewish mindset. That's worship. David knew what altar is because he's the worshiper of God. He built an altar. And believe me, as we worship, it's not just, worship is not just on Sundays, guys. I know you love worship here. Amen? But worship is not just four or five songs on a Sunday. Worship is every day. Worship is when you sing and pray. Worship is when you work out there. Do you honor God with everything? Worship is when you go to class prepared. Okay? When all the cheaters come, you know the answer. You don't need to cheat. Worship is passing your projects on time and never late. How can you preach in the office when all these things, oh, you know, where's your sweetheart? You know, every one of us has sweetheart. You know, so it's pressure. Why? Will I be a less person? Will you be a less person kung wala kang sweetheart? Tell them. Darating yan. Discipleship can be easy to, to speak of but there's a cost to it. Are you willing to separate the wheat from the chaff? Are you willing to walk away from sins you enjoy? Are you willing to walk away from compromise? Are you willing to walk away from that kind of heart that's lukewarm? God said, I'm about to spit you. Ano ka ba? Hot or cold? It's either sana, I can make you something, but you're lukewarm. What can I do with you? Amen? Let's stop that because God looks at the heart of us, not just the heart of David. God is looking for David's in this church. God's looking for David worshipers. He said, I will be even more undignified than this. You know what happened? Verse 26, chapter 21, fire in the sky. He put the fellowship offering and the burnt offerings. God, fire in the sky. Consume the offering. That's why the title of this is Built from Ashes. You look at that, you want God's visitation, not the emotional side. That's not visitation. When God visits, when God visits, remember Abraham? I remember Pastor Dave always saying this, that covenant, he made him sleep, right? The offering was there, God passed in the middle, fire came and ate that. You know, real visitation, the real visitations from God changes people. Real visitations has fire on it. Alam mo dumating. And real visitations always leaves ashes. Ashes are the things we offer God, our compromises. The best things we don't want to give God. They're not necessarily sin, but things you don't want to give up. Lord, oh, this relationship, it's a lang to sa buhay ko. If I give it, wala na. So what the? Wala na. Right? This business deal, Lord, okay lang if it's under the table, I lose millions. Why? Can God not provide another? Right? 
Come on. Visitations of God is marked by burning. He needs to be there. I know it's fire prevention month. <laughs> but that's not what I mean. Okay lang yan sa mga bahay natin, but in your life, allow it to be fire month. Lord, visit me. There are things in my life you need to burn. Since I still enjoy, when you convict me, I cry, cry, and then do it again. Why do you keep doing that? Because you're not really repenting. You like your sin. It's your favorite sin. Stop it. God's pointing his finger. You want to grow anointed? Who wants to be anointed? You want to be anointed? Oh, yun. Anong? Where are the ashes? Oh, Lord. I don't want the ash. Okay. Is, are ashes good or bad? Ashes are testimony of God's visitation. They change us. Ashes are living proof and evidence that God indeed walk in our midst and things turned around change. The more the ashes, the greater the anointing. That's why I said, you want more? Let God burn a lot of that. Because those things stop you from becoming used by God. Whenever God sees weakness in us, humility in us, childlikeness, a devoted heart, He comes and burn things. Why? Because that's His job. He doesn't want anything to separate us from His love. Ashes are a memorial. Ashes are blessings. You know, the mat you know maturity is marked by ashes in our lives. You know, sunog talaga ni Gajan. Okay, as we end, they're part of our life. Ashes are part of our life that cannot be burned again. Why? May nakita ka bang abo na na abo ulit? Right? Those are God's victories over our life. When we reduce to ashes, natuto ka na, you won't repeat it. Somebody fall in adultery, why will I do that? I know how it feels to burn. I'm exposed for cheating. I know how it's so shameful to be exposed. You will not repeat it again. But if I say, Pastor, I keep repeating, wala pa ashes. Are you afraid? Don't be. God wants to perfect that. That's the heart of our pastors wanting to see that in us. Finally, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. This is Solomon, actually. God told David, you're not building the temple. Your hands are full of blood. It will be your son. This is the day... Okay, in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, this is the day Solomon went up that mount where David offered a sacrifice to build the temple. Diba? That's the day. Guys, when God is ready to build something permanent in our life, he looks for ashes. You want to be blessed, Lord? You promised me I'll be a millionaire. Yes, He wants it to be permanent. Tanong. He won't let you millionaire, even hundreds of millionaires, or even a billionaire. He looks for ashes. Because ashes tells God, this guy is ready. A lot of people go to marriage because excited lang sila, tama tama, beauty and the beast. Forever. <laughs> Let me tell you, hashtag, merong forever, meron talaga. But before you go to the altar, ask that girl and that guy, may ash ka ba? May sinunog ba? Because if we enter marriage unburned, we will burn one another. Alive. And that marriage will fall faster than we started. Ang tanong, are you ready? That's why Pastor Dave is doing counseling. Ama, pag kinakasal, walang, walang shortcut ha. You know why we do that? You want to make sure you know what you're going to. You know what's in your heart. Guys, God is ready. That is business. His business is to burn things. Sins, failures, junks, garbage, pride, whatever that is in our life. That's His business. We live in a dysfunctional generation born out of the failures of our lolo and dads. What they did, they did. We cannot undo what my, my dad did. You cannot undo, undo what your lolo did. It's happening all over. But if we ever stop that in our lifetime, please, please, all this dysfunction, offer it to the altar and tell God, Lord, just like this guy, I'm willing to let it burn. 
And every day as I worship you, point me areas in my life that need to burn before you. Because those are pleasing aromas to honor you. And those will keep me close to you and not apart from you because there is no more wall to separate us. Our fathers are not perfect. They have failed. We ourselves fail people. But the question is, God always built on our father's mistakes. David was mistaken most of his life. But with that kind of offering and altar, that's where Solomon also built something permanent. Amen? We want something permanent in our relationship, in our blessings, in our work. But do you have the character? And that character is born out of the burning of ashes. God wants ashes. God wants that so that he could build a memorial, a permanent one, to honor that relationship we had in each and every one of us.